Again, I would like to thank those of you that are tuning in. Uh, those that have tuned in on multiple occasions have enjoyed uh, the messages. Uh, we are located in Wilton, New Hampshire, Good News Bible Church on 27 Hutchinson Road. And we meet at 10 a.m. on Sundays. And we would love to have you come visit. If you do not have a church home, uh, please come and visit us and be blessed. Thank you. Good morning and welcome. We are entering the Advent season. This is the first Sunday of the Advent of our Lord that we celebrate. And as we were entering into this Advent season this morning, we're going to look at some prophetic scriptures that uh, are considered the special revelation of God to man. And this revelation has everything to do with how a person deals with life. And these prophetic truths, they are foundational to a biblical worldview based on the grace of God. And again, has everything with being overcomers in this world. So to begin with, we know from Scripture that the advent of Jesus Christ, the Messiah, was prophesied from the very beginning in the Garden of Eden with the fall of Adam and Eve. We see it in Genesis 3.14. So the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and all wild animals. You will crawl on your belly and you will eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. Now, the Bible knowledge commentary says this, God's words to the serpent included the announcement that the snake crawling and eating dust would be a perpetual reminder to mankind of the temptation and the fall and be an oracle about the power behind the snake. God said there would be a perpetual struggle between satanic forces and mankind. It would be between Satan and the woman in their respective offsprings or seeds. The offspring of the woman was Cain, and then all humanity at large, and then Christ and those collectively in him, being in Christ. The offspring of the serpent includes demons and anyone serving his kingdom of darkness, those whose father is the devil, according to John 8, 44. Satan would cripple mankind. You will strike at his heel, but the seed, Christ, the Messiah, would deliver the fatal blow. He would crush Satan's head. The seed is prophetic of the Messiah, Jesus. Throughout history, God spoke messages through his prophet foretelling the future appearance of a Messiah. It would be through the advent of the Messiah that God would be known and spiritual darkness would be overtaken by light. Furthermore, through the advent of Jesus, man would have some answers as to how to deal with the realities of life. Isaiah, one of the Lord's prophets, spoke concerning the condition of man. And as God spoke through him, we hear this. This is what God, the Lord, says. He who created the heavens and stretched them out, who spread out the earth and all that comes out of it, who gives breath to its people and life to those who walk on it. I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness. I will take hold of your hand. I will keep you and will make you to be a covenant for the people and a light for the Gentiles. To open eyes that are blind, to free captives from prison, and to release from the dungeon those who sit in darkness. I am the Lord. That is my name. I will not give my glory to another or my praise to idols. See, the former things have taken place, and new things I declare. Before they spring into being, I announce them to you. Now, this is speaking of Christ, but it's also speaking of people and the condition of people. God declares that people are blind, without sight, without spiritual sight. They're captive. They're prisoners. They're sitting in a spiritual darkened dungeon. And the reason for this spiritual captivity is sin brought about by the fall. Adam and Eve's rebellion against the commands and the love of God has plunged man into satanic spiritual darkness because all men are born into a sinful nature. 
The reality about this world we live in is that many people have been blinded by the God of this world and held captive to do his will. A truth that's not accepted, but a truth that is crystal clear to those who have been delivered out of spiritual darkness, which represents really spiritual blindness to truth. Many people have believed, received, and experienced redemption from this spiritual condition. And it is all and only because of the advent of Jesus the Christ, the Messiah. We know from history that this prophecy of Isaiah is twofold. The first part of this prophecy was fulfilled in part because King Cyrus was the servant God used to release Jewish captives from their 70-year uh, captivity. He allowed people to go back in to rebuild the walls in Jerusalem. The future prophetic nature of this prophecy, though, declares that the Messiah, the Christ, Jesus, gives spiritual release from spiritual darkness to all who would believe and trust in him. So this brings us to our four, first point this morning. In the person of Jesus, the Messiah is the illumination of man. Matthew 4, 16, the people living in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. Let me say this again. This is prophetic. Matthew 4, 16. The people living in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. The word light here means illumination, a light of instruction. Isaiah 28, 18. In that day, the deaf will hear the words of the scroll, and out of gloom and darkness, the eyes of the blind will see. Isaiah 42, 16, I will lead the blind by ways they have not known. Along unfamiliar paths, I will guide them. I will turn the darkness into light before them and make the rough places smooth. These are the things I will do. I will not forsake them. And then Isaiah 63, arise, shine, for your light has come and the glory of the Lord rises upon you. See, darkness covers the earth and thick darkness is over the peoples, but the Lord raises upon you, rises upon you, and his glory appears over you. Nations will come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your dawn. What is he speaking about? He's just speaking about Jesus Christ. And as was prophesied when they dedicated Jesus in the temple, Simeon said, the people living in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. This brings us to point number two. Jesus, the Messiah, sent by God, is the life and the light of men. The light and the life of men. Now, there was a man named Simeon who lived in Jerusalem. He was a righteous man and very devout. He was filled with the Holy Spirit, and he eagerly expected the Messiah to come and rescue Israel. The Holy Spirit had revealed to him that he would not die until he had seen the Lord's Messiah. That day, the Spirit led him to the temple. So when Mary and Joseph came to present the baby Jesus to the Lord as the law required, Simeon was there. And he took the child in his arm and he praised God saying, Lord, now I can die in peace. As you promised me, I have seen the Savior. You have given to all people. He is a light to reveal God to the nations and he is the glory of your people, Israel. He is a light to reveal God to the nations and he is the glory of your people, Israel. Simeon prophesied this. A light to reveal God to the nations. The life, teaching, sacrificial death, resurrection, ascension of Christ, the sending of the Holy Spirit is a light to reveal God to the world. This is the special revelation of God to man. The special revelation. His word that comes to pass and was fulfilled in Christ Jesus. It is through the life of Jesus that a person can experience illumination, spiritual sight through salvation that comes through Christ, through belief in him. John 1, 1 through 4, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. In him was life and that life was the light of men. You see, the gospel of Jesus contains Answers to the dilemma of sin and suffering and evil. 
and brings us the knowledge of salvation and eternal life. Christianity was not at all like the religions or the idol worship or the superstitions or worldviews of the day. John 1, 5, New King James Version says, And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. The nature of light as it shines is that it dispels darkness. Here we see darkness is personified and unable to overcome or overpower the light. But even when the light dispels the darkness of a person's spiritual condition, light can be rejected because truth can be rejected and often is. The word darkness here, Scotia, in the Greek, is an extended sense, in an extended sense, the darkness of the spirit or soul, used of ignorance of divine things and its associated wickedness. Satan and his demons, along with the people of this world who are held captive by him to do his will, resist the light but they are unable to frustrate its power. In the end, the word, the light, will be victorious in spite of all opposition. But for now, between the first advent and the second advent of Jesus, light has come to illuminate and free men from spiritual darkness. But the very source of light, the person of Jesus and his gospel, experiences opposition and hatred. Furthermore, the gifts that come with the advent of Christ are for everyone who would believe. This brings us to point number three. Jesus has come to heal, to liberate, to bring favor, comfort, to provide, to crown and clothe all who believe and place their faith and trust in him. Again, let me say this. Jesus has come to heal, to liberate, to bring favor, to comfort, to provide, to crown, and to clothe all who believe and place their faith and trust in him. The prophet Isaiah, 61 verse 6, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound. Jesus quoted this in his hometown of Nazareth when he entered the, ta- the temple and was given the scroll and sat in the Moses seat. He quoted Isaiah at the beginning of his earthly ministry. He said to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And then he stopped there. But it goes on to comfort all who mourn and provide for those who grieve, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. It will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. Remember that in the world in which we live, there are broken hearts, captive hearts, prisoners, grief abounds, Life is like burnt and and it just is like ashes. There's mourning, there's despair. Without the light of the gospel, man is destined to remain in this spiritually sinful, darkened state. But with the advent of Jesus, there is forgiveness, which causes the blind to see and sets the captive free. Furthermore, the teaching of Jesus and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit are foundational for man to be able to stand on and weather the storms of life. Through Jesus, man can experience healing and liberation. Again, favor, comfort, provision, crowning joy and praise. And there are certain doctrines of the Christian faith which dispel spiritual darkness and give clarity and sustaining power to all who believe the teachings of Jesus Christ. One of them is this, that the Lord is the creator and sustainer of the world. Isaiah 42, 5 and 9, this is what God the Lord says, He who created the heavens and stretched them out, who spread out the earth and all that comes out of it, who gives breath to its people and life to those who walk on it. Psalm 104, 1 through 3, O Lord my God, you are very great. You are clothed with splendor and majesty. He wraps himself in light 
as with a garment. He stretches out the heavens like a tent and lays the beams of his upper chambers on their waters. He wraps himself in light as with a garment. Isaiah 40, 28, do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary and his understanding no one can fathom. And Paul ties all this in with his declaration of who Jesus is to the church at Colossae when he said he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created by him and for him. He is before all things and in him all things hold together. One of the greatest doctrines that we have is that the Lord is a creator and the sustainer. That is the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. All there when, when life as we know it began. And there's a hope in this. There's a peace in knowing that, no, it's just not random. Nothing plus no one didn't, uh, didn't create all this. It's God and his word that created what we see. And we're not alone. It's not survival of the fittest. And it's not random choice. The word consists in the Greek. In him all things hold together. The word consists means strengthen, to set together, to hold together, to unite, to be or have existence in. All things consist in him. The sun is a radiance of God's glory, the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. The Lord is personal, he's loving, and most of all, in charge of everything. Job said, I know that you can do all things and no plan of yours can be thwarted. Job said this after he just kept saying, why was I even born? Why did I have to go through what I went through? Now, getting back to a little bit about last week. Though America was founded by some very godly men, and we even have universities in colonial days that were birthed for biblical reasons, and though our constitution was formed for a Christian nation, even in colonial times, Christianity was being challenged way back. Not long after the pilgrims landed, deism challenged Christianity. What is deism? Well, according to Noah Webster's 1828 dictionary, the belief or system of religious opinions of those who acknowledge the existence of one God but deny revelation, the belief in a natural religion only, or those truths and doctrine and practice which man is able to discover by light of reason, independent and exclusive of any revelation from God. And we just established that, that the word of God is God's special revelation. Hence, deism implies infidelity of a disbelief in the divine origin of the scripture. Patrick Henry, a member of the Continental Congress, commander in chief of the Virginia militia and five time governor of the state of Virginia boldly declared, it cannot be emphasized too strongly or too often that this great nation was founded not by religionists, but by Christians, not on religions, but on the gospel of Jesus Christ. For this very reason, peoples of other faith have been offered asylum prosperity and freedom to worship here. And then he made this following statement. The view which the rising greatness of our country presents to my eyes is greatly tarnished by the general prevalence of deism, which with me is but another name for vice and depravity. You see, deism challenged the Christian worldview and spread its lies that God was not involved with man or in control of this world. And this belief makes God out to be impersonal, uncaring, elusive, and unknowing. And this challenges another doctrine of Christianity. 
one that we hold dear. Number two, the cross of Christ is proof that the Lord loves and sympathizes with man. Hebrews 4, 15 and 16, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but we have one who has been tempted in every way just as we are, yet without sin. Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Christ without sin, tempted as we are. The Lamb of God, the perfect Lamb, blameless Lamb of God, unspotted Lamb of God who takes upon the sins of the world upon himself, who died for all of us and all our sin, died in our place, loves us and sympathizes with us. But you see, with deism, the cross doesn't mean anything. Long before we go through anything in life, God's already been there. He goes before us, he stands beside us, and he hems us in. He has our six, but according to deism, it's not true. And so it's hard to, to grab hold of this second point of the cross of Christ, which we hold dear because it's our salvation, it's our redemption. It's what brought us light from spiritual darkness. There's another doctrine we hold dear. Disciples of Jesus have the assurance of acceptance. For deists, you don't really know. You just believe there's a God, but you just believe he just created you and, and dumped you here. And you're on your own. But it's not the God that we know. It's a different God. Listen to this. John 10, 28, 29. I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one can snatch them out of my hand. My Father has given them to me is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. Hebrews 10, 22, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and full assurance of faith. And then Ephesians 3, 12, in him and through faith in him, we may approach God with freedom and confidence. Why? Because light has come. It's come into a person's heart when they believe in Christ as their savior and they are delivered out of spiritual darkness and they'll experience full assurance. They'll experience that security that no one will ever take them out of the father's hand. They experience freedom, liberty, true spiritual freedom and liberty and confidence to approach and commune with God by faith that he listens and hears our prayers, that he loves us, that we have purpose, Light has come. But because deism rejects the word of God, God's special revelation to man, it does away with the cross of Christ. It does away with the salvation and assurance of a believer in Christ. It does away with the resurrection of Christ and the resurrection of the dead. Deism really refuses to see the light. But deism also makes another assumption. Letter A, that the belief that the only reason the world exists is for the benefit of man. If a person believes that God's not in charge of what happens and he does not intervene, then they're claiming to have control of their own destiny. Philosopher Charles Taylor describes contemporary secularity by saying that we live inside an imminent frame the view that the world is a completely natural order without any supernatural. It is a completely imminent world over against a possible transcendent one because there is no transcendent spirit, supernatural out, order outside of me. It is I who determine what I am and who I will be. Timothy Keller says Western culture's imminent frame weakens intellectual belief in God and makes heart certain certainty even more difficult to come by. But this partial Christianity or theism is far more difficult to hold in the face of horrendous suffering than is atheism. Natural even offends natural evil offends those who believe in a God who exists for us and confounds those who don't believe we are all sinners needing salvation by sheer grace. It is as we get larger in our own eyes, less dependent on the grace of God and revelation, ensure that we understand how the universe works and how history should go, that the problem of evil becomes so intolerable. If you believe that the world was made for our benefit, 
by God, then horrendous suffering and evil will shake your understanding of life. And those beliefs hold captive those who embrace them. You see, when suffering and evil happen, people come face to face with a crisis of what they really believe. And they begin to question, and sometimes in a negative way, how can a good God allow such things to happen? And if you believe that the world was made for your benefit only, then you will struggle with suffering and evil in your world. In fact, if you are personally suffering, you are witness firsthand of the evil of this world. And you will question whether God really loves you or not, or worse, you may even question the existence of God altogether. Even Christians that buy into the concept that the world exists for their pleasure and purpose alone find themselves in a dilemma when the storms of life catch them unaware. Listen to this. A study was done about the rise of gnomes, Americans who profess no religious affiliation, gnomes. Trinity College analysts concluded that gnomes make up 15% of the population, that given their rate of rapid growth, their numbers might soon surpass the nation's largest denominations. But 51% say they believe in God. But 24% when asked what kind of a God they believed in responded by saying a higher power, but not a personal God. That could mean that 3.6% of Americans could be considered deists making them more common than Jews, Muslims, Hindus, Episcopalians, Presbyterians, or Mormons. And that's if you use a pretty narrow definition of deism. What is scary about this is that this quote, this study was done in 2009, but the spiritual darkness runs much deeper Timothy Keller again says, we see ourselves as able to control our own destiny. According to, uh, I'm sorry, we ourselves, we see ourselves as able to control our own destiny, able to discern for ourselves what is right and wrong. And we see God obligated to arrange things for our benefit, especially if we live a good enough life according to our chosen standards. Sociologists, Christian Smith calls this mindset moralistic, moralistic, therapeutic deism. That's powerful. As we stated, these beliefs crumble when tragedy strikes or when the storms of life come in like a flood and beat upon the house that's built on the sand of false teachings on biblical word, worldviews and the wisdom of the world. The way out of the spiritual darkness associated with these things is to embrace the person and teaching of Jesus, the Messiah, the Christ, the true light, because there is no darkness in him at all. But you see, let her be, if you believe that God owes you when pain and suffering enter your life, you will question the love of God. I've seen this firsthand and it's devastating. Christians walking with God and then the storms of life hit and the questions start. And instead of experiencing grace that is sufficient to see them through, they're plunged into despair, anger, resentment, and become captive to bitterness. And sometimes they outright reject God. It's been said suffering is unbearable if you are not certain that God is for you and with you. You see, light has come, but light hasn't change the world completely yet. That's a work that Christ will do in the end. Behold, I make all things new. Everything's not new yet. We live in a broken world. We live in a world where there's so much hurt and so much suffering and so much evil. It's around us all the time. But this brings us to another Christian doctrine, the most comforting of all. Number four, the bodily resurrection of the dead for all who believe. Acts 4, 2 says, They were greatly disturbed because the apostles were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. Acts 24, 14 and 15, However, I admit that I worship the God of our fathers as a follower of the way, 
which they call a sect. I believe everything that agrees with the law and that is written in the prophets. And I have the same hope in God as these men, that there will be a resurrection of both the righteous and the wicked. You see, the early church stared death in the face with the hope of eternity. If you believe there is just this higher power, just this, this, this God that created everything and then boom, we're on our own and he's in personal law, then, then you don't have any hope for eternity. The word of God isn't the special revelation. And you question whether or not there's a heaven. And here's the crazy thing. There are more deists today. I run into people all the time and I ask them about God and, and they'll say, well, I, I, I believe there's something. I believe there's some higher power. That's deism. You see, you take away the light of the gospel, which is Christ crucified and risen again, and there is absolutely no hope. No hope. The assurance, the assurance of salvation and eternal life are two of the most important Christian doctrines. To know that you're saved, to know that you'd never lose your salvation, and to know that there's a heaven and you're going to be there are two of the most fundamental important beliefs and doctrines of the followers of Jesus Christ. They are foundational in that they give us hope for the future. You see, in a broken world with broken hearts and broken lives, the hope of a future where all things are made new, where we will be re reunited with loved ones is the most comforting belief we could ever have. And these doctrines are what help us get through the storms of life. In short, theism without certainty of salvation or resurrection is far more disillusioning in the midst of pain than atheism. When suffering, believing in God thinly or in the abstract, I'm sorry, when suffering, believing in God thinly or in the abstract is worse than not believing in God at all. So why do we celebrate and proclaim the advent of Jesus Christ? Why are we celebrating Christmas? Because there are broken hearted, blind, captive prisoners still sitting in spiritual darkened dungeons and light has come. That's why we celebrate. There will be people this year that are gonna get so caught up in Christmas season as they do every year, buying and giving of gifts and receiving of gifts and having a meal together and, and toasting and, and you know Christmas trees and the whole 10 yards. And there's no thought of Jesus, the Messiah at all. And that's what this season's all about. He is the reason for this season. What is the chief end of man? Remember we said this a few weeks ago? Man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. How do we glorify God while here on earth? As believers, last point, the continuation of the advent of Jesus lives on through our lives. The continuation of the advent of Jesus lives on through our lives as disciples of Jesus Christ. Listen. Light has come. Say that with me. Light has come. John in his first epistle said, this is a message we have heard from him and declare to you, God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in darkness, we lie and do not live by the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. The, one of the greatest messages we have is that because of the cross, because the Messiah came, because Jesus came to this earth, pitched his tent and dwells among us, now dwells in us, that our sins can be forgiven. Listen. Listen. John 8, 12, when Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. 
I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And then John 12, verse 35b through 36, the man who walks in the dark does not know where he is going. Put your trust in the light while you have it so that you may become sons of light. The continuation of the Lord's ministry, which is to do what? which is to help people to see the light, to see Jesus so they can be delivered out of those spiritual dungeons so that they can see spiritually, so they don't have to mourn anymore, so that they can be comforted because we can comfort them with the message that we've received. Put your trust in the light. We are called to put our trust in the gospel of Jesus Christ. The light of the doctrine gives us purpose, hope, and answers for a world held captive. In fact, letter A, people who possess the light of Jesus within their lives, they will glorify God. Jesus later said, you are the light of the world. Think of that. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. You are the light of the world. The light of the world often represents the sun. The sun clarifies objects by making them visible to us. Light shows their form, their nature, their beauties, their deformities. The term light is also applied to religious teachers such as rabbis. Light is applied to Jesus because he is, in the moral world, what the sun is in the natural world. The apostles, Christian ministers, and all believers are lights of the world because by their association With Christ, they show that God requires what is man's true spiritual condition, and they can show the way to eternal life. And notice the phrase, gives light to all. Lamps are not good for anything unless a person is willing to use them. It is light we have to seek for. The darkness comes without seeking. Our lamp can also be a help and blessing for others who are stumbling in the dark. And this leads us To our last point, because you are called to be the light of the world, you will emulate Jesus. Paul, in his second letter to the church at Corinth, says, Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we who with unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory are being transformed into his likeness with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is a Spirit. Author Robert Fulgram, sometimes when attending lectures, would respond in an unusual way to the speaker's final routine words. Are there any questions? Yes, Fulgram would say. And then he asks, what is the meaning of life? People generally laugh and gather their notes, prepared to leave as the speaker smiles and shrugs off the question. But one day, to his surprise, Fulgram got a special or serious answer. It was from Dr. Alexander Papadouros, a Greek philosopher and the founder of an institute on the island of Crete. At the end of a lecture one day, Dr. Papadouros asked, are there any questions? Yes, said Fulgram. What is the meaning of life? The other attendees attendees whispered and chuckled and prepared to leave, but Dr. Papadouros held up his hand. I will answer your question, he said. He drew from his pocket a small round mirror about the size of a quarter. As he was growing up during the war, his family was very poor and he had few toys. One day, he found the broken pieces of a mirror left over from a wreck of a German motorcycle. He tried in vain to piece the bits together, but finally ended up discarding all but the largest piece. This one, he said, holding it higher. And by scratching it on a stone, I made it round. I began to play with it as a toy and became fascinated by the fact that I could reflect light into dark places where the sun would never shine. 
in deep holes and crevices and dark closets. It became a game for me to get light into the most inaccessible places I could find. I kept the little mirror. And as I went about my growing up, I would take it out in idle moments and continue the challenge of the game. As I became a man, I grew to understand that this was not just a child's game, but a metaphor for what I might do in my life. With what I have, I can reflect light into the dark places of this world, into the black places in the hearts of men, and change some things in some people. Having said this, Dr. Papadouris took the small mirror and holding it carefully, caught the rays of the daylight streaming through the window and reflected them into Robert Fulgrim's face. Light has come and it is Jesus. If you are a believer, a follower, a disciple of Jesus, then the light of Jesus is in you. Go then and shine the light to others that they may too know that light has come. <laughs>